Let me uh, just open our time here in a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we do pray that all glory would be to you this morning uh, in our hearts, that you would draw out worship as we hear from your word. Uh, we come to you in prayer again as, as we sang that we know that God, unless you build the house, all who labor build it in vain. So we pray that you would work through your word. Lord, that you would uh, just draw hearts and lives closer to yourself into conformity with Christ, that you would open even blind eyes this morning. Jesus, we love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, good morning. Please uh, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Smed is uh, out this week, so we're taking a break from Revelation. Plan is to be back in Revelation next week. But I have an opportunity. It's great to be the, uh, the guest preacher. If you don't know me, my name is Kyle Frazee. I uh, lead the, the students here at the church and the young adults ministry. But, uh, but I get to come and I just get to, to bring a passage that's been on my heart and just share with you uh, something that the Lord has been uh, just burdening me with and uh, gripping me with uh, in Matthew 16, just this basic command to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, a few months ago, I uh, took a group of our young adults to a missions conference. Uh, it was a conference on the, the Great Commission and the role of the church to plant other churches, to make disciples. And uh, it was uh, such a great conference. And I walked away just, just realizing what a privilege it is to be in a church that, that sends out missionaries and church planters, that is committed to church planting. But as I walked away from that conference, I, I was so encouraged, and at the same time, I I had a burden, uh, a burden for really the, the next generation of this church, really for, for you and me who are here, that we might uh, resonate with those truths. We might interact with missionaries and church planners. You, know, you can hear someone like Jeremy Lehman even this morning. And we might, might hear those things and we might even say those same truths. And we might come to a passage like Matthew 16. And we might be tempted to think because we are in a church that plants churches and sends out missionaries, that I have done this. I have counted this cost. You know, I have checked the box here. And there's a, a temptation for us to not wrestle with the, the command of Jesus in this passage, even in a faithful church. You know, that we can look at others who have gone before us. We can look at their lives of conviction. And we can miss that this is a command for each of us to, to count the cost, to take up our cross, to follow Christ. So I, my prayer this morning is that, that each of us would be gripped, individually gripped by the, the call of Jesus, a sacrificial, costly call, that the, the same truths that grip the, you know, the missionaries, the church planters, you know, the Omri Miles, the Zach Cans, the Josh Kelsos, the men we've sent out from this church, that you would be gripped by those same truths. Those, those men and the women we've sent out from this church were gripped by passages like Matthew 16, and, and their life was ordered under submission to a passage like this. Their priorities under a passage like this. So my prayer is that you would, would feel the, the burden of this passage. You would feel the, the conviction. You would have a deep-rooted conviction to, to count the cost, to, even again today, to follow Christ. So we're going to look at this morning some, some resolutions uh, as we think about uh, a new year, it's a good time to, to assess what are you going after this year. And that's what this passage will do for us. Uh, what I'm calling uh, this morning, Four Resolves. Four Resolves for, for 2024 to be lived with conviction. To be lived with conviction. That this passage would be not just a, a passage that makes missionaries, but a passage that would, like I said, would grip you, that you would have conviction uh, when, I, when I say conviction, what I mean is a, a life that is so controlled by certain truths from God's word that your priorities change, that what you live for changes, that how you spend your time changes, what you love changes. So we're going to make some, what I'm calling resolves. I didn't use the word resolutions because if it's a New Year's resolution, you'll forget it by January 15th. So resolve, it sounds more intense. So four resolves in this passage that we're going to see toward a, a life of conviction so that you would uh, align your life under the truths that you see here. Uh, my old boss, who is also my father-in-law, used to, uh, at the start of each year, kind of lay out, here's the, the goals for this year. This is what we're going after. 
And he would ask this question of everyone. He'd say, are you still in faith for these goals? Are we still in faith together for this plan? And I love that question just at the end of a year to say, are we in faith? So we get an opportunity as a church to say, are we in faith? Are we still going after these same things? That we get to, to ask ourselves, really to re-up as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me read the passage here, Matthew 16. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 28. Matthew 16, starting in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised upon the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. In this passage in the Gospel of Matthew stands as a, really a transition point in the book, a transition of Jesus' ministry. You see at verse 21, he says, from that time. This is where Jesus uh, clearly states the, the purpose of his ministry. He unfolds what is coming. Before this point in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus has alluded to his death, he has talked about, like Jonah, being in the, in the belly of the well. He has made allusions to death, but here is the first time he clearly says that he will die. He tells them by whom he will die. He tells them where he will die. That he will be dead three days. That he will be raised. Every detail. And from this time forward, you see Jesus reiterate again and again, preparing his disciples And really, verse 21, you could see as an overview for the rest of the book. From this time forward, Jesus marching toward Jerusalem to death. And as I uh, read the the gospel account of of Matthew this Christmas season, the first couple of chapters, I was struck by the the phrase that shows up over and over again in the first couple of chapters, that that Jesus, the, the prophecies about Jesus were to fulfill what the prophets had spoken, were to fulfill what Isaiah had spoken. That Jesus is the, the fulfillment, the, the Messiah who was promised in the Old Testament. Matthew over and over again points to Jesus being the promised Messiah, that he has fulfilled the promises from the line of Abraham, from the line of David. And if you look back a couple of verses, Peter knows this. He agrees with this. Look back at verse 13. This is maybe a a day earlier. Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi and he was asking his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But he said, but who do you say that I am? And here Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter gets it. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the coming King, the the promised Savior. And now, here in verse 21, Jesus tells the disciples, This is how I'm going to save. This is how I'm going to conquer. I'm going to conquer through death through suffering, through an excruciating death on a cross. And this is where the the lesson starts for the disciples as he is preparing them. He is preparing them to be men of conviction. These men who will go out to preach the gospel, to to start, to initiate the church. They will carry this message. And in this school of Jesus here, he tells them that the, the path is a path of suffering. The Messiah must suffer and you must suffer. 
And that's what we talk about. When we talk about a life of conviction, that's what I mean. It is a life that says, I will follow Jesus regardless of the cost. I'm so committed to Christ, I would go anywhere. I would do anything. I won't shy away from any sacrifice. I will be unflinching with the truth. And right off the bat here, we see a problem, a spiritual issue that Peter reveals for us, something that would crush our conviction. The the first point here, first resolve, the, the problem we must conquer. A problem you must be resolved to, to crush this year. You see it in, in Peter's response as Jesus says that he must go to Jerusalem. He must die. Peter responds. And in Peter's response, we see the problem. The problem is self. Uh, self-centeredness. Uh, man-centered thinking. Peter here has an aversion to hardship a love of comfort that would shrink back from doing hard things for the sake of Christ. Jesus in verse 21 says that he must go. He must suffer. He must die. This word must is important. He is saying it is necessary. That is to say God has declared it this way. He has sovereignly planned it this way. And he has prophesied. His prophets have spoken that this would happen. It is the will of the Father to crush his own son. And Peter responds, really, as the, the spokesperson for the disciples and a, and a spokesperson for us, too, for, for our flesh to cry out, Forbid it, Lord. Jesus is saying, this is what I came to the earth to do. Verse 22, Peter took him aside, rebuked him. The, the strongest negation possible. This can never happen. And not only that, Peter says, God forbid it. Your translation might say, God forbid it, far be it from you. Uh, Really, it's a colloquialism that he is using. He literally says, mercy be to you, Jesus. He's invoking the mercy of God, saying, if God is merciful, and I know he is, he would never let this happen. A merciful God would not allow his son to suffer. Peter here is rebuking Jesus, citing God's mercy his justice, saying, not if God and me have anything to do with this, Jesus, you will not suffer and die. I was, as I was reading this, I was reminded of a story that a friend told me about the, the time that he made his father the most upset, the most upset he ever saw his dad when he was a teenager. And in the story, he said he got home from school and he, uh, he chewed out his mom. His mom was upset at him for something and, and my friend said he chewed his mom out, I think maybe made her cry, you know, you're being ridiculous, mom. I can't believe you'd say that. And then his dad gets home. His dad, who was a, a godly man. And he says to his dad, you will never believe what mom did. I can't believe the way that she treated me. And, and this man said to his son, don't you ever, don't you ever talk about my wife that way again. And, and I thought about this story as I thought about this passage, because this is what Peter is doing. He's saying, Jesus, me and God will not let this happen. And Jesus here rebuking him, do not talk about my father that way. This is God's plan. In verse 23, he turns, he pulls Peter aside from the rest of the 12. And really you could see turning, maybe turning his back on Peter as he says, get behind me, putting Peter behind him to face the 12. He says, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block. Jesus here rebuking Peter, Peter who has invoked God's mercy. He's saying, you are not going after God's plan. You are going after a a satanic plan, a man-centered plan. You think about Satan. Satan's highest aim is himself. He is about his own glory, not about God's glory, about his own self-exaltation. And here, Peter is displaying a satanic mindset because he can't imagine that God would have a greater purpose than his own purpose. Think about the, the pride on display. Jesus' suffering is a shock to Peter. It's a shock to his flesh. You remember back to Matthew 4, the temptation of Jesus by Satan. Listen to Matthew 4, verse 8 and 9. It says, this is the the third temptation. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to Jesus, all these things I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. This is Satan's temptation of the Lord Jesus. He's saying all the kingdoms of the world can be yours. Jesus, you are already the rightful king. 
You are the son of David. I will give all of these kingdoms to you. They're already yours. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to die. You don't have to go to the cross. You can have all of this without death. In Jesus' response, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus is entirely committed to the will of his Father. He's saying he must go to the cross. To glorify God, he must. To save his people, he must. And Peter here takes up this same cause, the cause of Satan. He's saying, you are the king. This is not the way. This is not the way to bring about your kingdom. Peter only saw the the pain, not the glory. He only saw suffering. He wasn't able to see what was beyond the suffering. Jesus is the conquering king, but first he must suffer and die. He must be the sacrifice for his people. Peter here claiming to speak on behalf of God is really speaking on behalf of himself. This is man's agenda. And really the agenda of self, Peter's agenda. The day before, Peter had announced Jesus as the Messiah. Clearly a believer. Jesus says, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. And this should shock us. This should sober us. That that a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, one who has the right eschatology, he knows that Jesus will be king. Peter here, who is a a missionary, a sent one, he has given up everything, falls into this kind of worldly thinking. He wants Christ to rule. He wants him to build his church and the gates of hell not prevail. He can say yes and amen to those promises. But when Jesus reveals that the pathway to victory is suffering, is death, that his followers would await the same fate, a life of self-denial, This is where Peter responds, no, Lord. It's so easy to say, yes, I want Jesus to be king. I want peace on this earth. It's as if Peter has built up in his own imagination how his life will go. This is how my life will unfold. I have plans for me and Jesus. I have plans for a, a kingdom while I'll sit at his right hand. This is how my future, these are my ambitions. And Jesus just shatters all of them in verse 21. Jesus here has a a better plan for Peter's life, a much harder plan for Peter's life. Jesus is going to build a kingdom on this earth, yes, but he is after hearts and affections. He will rule on the throne of David, but he must also rule in the human heart. You know, this kingdom will include worshipers, worshipers who love Christ. This is where the dominion of Jesus extends into hearts, into lives. And we find ourselves so often in this mindset of Peter, squeezed into self-centered, worldly thinking, thinking that life is about me. We take our eyes off of Christ. We start to imagine all these things are for my comfort, for my glory, so I can enjoy my own life. And this is the, the fundamental issue as we start this new year to battle to the ground, the obstacle. You know, our, our problem is ourself eyes that are focusing on me. We must crush this monster, self, the me monster. Being saved into the service of Jesus is a a wholesale denial of self. You stop being in control of your own life. You, You have a different master now. And that's where Jesus goes in verse 24. As a response to Peter, no, Peter, here is a better way. That brings us to the second point here in your outline. The second resolve, the path you must follow. To be resolved this year to follow this path, this costly path that Jesus lays out. This famous verse, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In his book, uh, The Gospel According to Jesus, John MacArthur writes this book as a a response to a, a mindset of easy believism. Really, with the passages like this, the, the cost of following Christ. But he starts this book with three words. The first three words of this book are Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And he says in this book, the single central foundational and distinguishing article of Christianity is that Jesus is Lord, that he has the supreme right to rule your life. And that, that is the path here, coming under the lordship of Jesus Christ forsaking everything you've made of yourself to say, Jesus, you must be Lord, to have no competing affections in your heart. 
A.B. Bruce, in his book, Training of the Twelve, he says, it is as if above the door of the school in which the mystery of, it, of redemption was to be taught, he had inscribed this legend, let no man who is unwilling to deny himself and take up his cross enter here. You know, this is an open invitation. Anyone who would come after me, all are welcome. Jesus has already in Matthew 11 said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden. An open, open invitation to life. But here, this, this three-pronged requirement, these three commands, you must deny yourself, you must take up your cross, and you must follow. And he says deny yourself. This is not uh, some self-punishing mindset. Not saying to have a, a morose life. You know, not go to a monastery. Remove yourself from the world. This is not a command to stop enjoying life. This is a, a command to stop living life for yourself. That your will must be submitted under the lordship of Jesus Christ. To renounce your old self. To no longer promote yourself. To be wrapped up in the cause of promoting God above self. You know, service of self and service of Christ cannot coexist in your heart. Anywhere you try to serve yourself, you, you will be unwilling to serve Christ in that area. Where, where self-service, self-love is unchecked. It will, it will crush your ability to serve the Lord. So he says, deny yourself and then take up your cross. Like Christ, there is a, a path for you, Christian, a path to follow that involves sacrifice, that, that involves hardship even. To embrace those things, suffering maybe, loss for the sake of Christ. Uh, the cross here, this Roman tool of execution. For the, the Jews here, for them to hear, take up your cross, the, the Romans, this tool they used, the Romans who were still ruling the land of Israel. Jesus, the Messiah who came to, to be king, he's going to overtake Rome, isn't he? And now he's saying, take up this tool, this hideous tool of execution that the Romans use and, and follow me on this path of suffering. Embrace ridicule, pain, shame, Maybe rejection by your own family. This is the path you must follow. This is, this is part of the deal. This is what it looks like to follow Christ. A life of sacrifice. And then he says, you must follow. Align your will with God's will. This is the, the great commission. Jesus says, teaching them to obey all that I commanded you. You follow Jesus. Your life in submission to what he says. You obey everything he has commanded. He, he is the Lord, so he gets to tell us what to do. This is not just a command, come and suffer. No, come and follow. There will be hardships and there will be good, th good things. There will be sunshine and sorrow, but follow me. Go after his will in your parenting, in your workplace, in your daily life. Be a follower of Jesus Christ. You could paraphrase this way, this verse. This is to say, once and for all to say farewell to self. To decisively accept shame, mistreatment, loss, and to follow, and to keep on following day after day, week after week, year after year, to be a follower of Christ. This is what it means to be, to be part of the church. You have embraced this command. Together, we have said we are going to die to ourselves to follow the Lord Jesus. We're going to submit under his authority. We're going to encourage each other to this end. And this is a life of conviction to say, Jesus, I'm going to follow. I'm going to learn from you. I'm going to obey you regardless of what it costs, regardless of what changes I have to make, regardless of uh, hard conversations, things I have to give up. I am going to follow. And this is a, a package deal. Take up your cross, deny self, and follow. Again, this is not a, a missionary passage. This is a, a Christian passage. This is the, the doorway in. This is what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. And it's good for us uh, at a new year just to consider, as we consider our lives, consider maybe some things in your life that maybe you have made off limits in this, this pursuit of the Lord Jesus. What are areas of your life that you're saying, I'm, I'm unwilling to give up? I'll go this far, but no further. Maybe it's uh, a hard conversation. Maybe it's a sin that you just don't want to give up. Maybe it's confessing something you don't want others to know. Maybe it's a much harder decision that the Lord asks of you. 
But here, the, the call is to embrace the lordship of Jesus Christ, to see all of life as service to him. And at this point, you could hear only loss, only hardship, only pain, only suffering, as if following Jesus is some kind of tragedy, as if it's uh, just sorrowful. But here, Jesus gives us encouragement. He does not leave us there. The next four verses, 25 through 28, there is a, a reward. You deny yourself. You give up love of self. You embrace this hard call, but you gain life. This is where this is going. You gain eternal life. Verse 25, whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever goes down this path, who says, yes, Jesus, you are worth it, they will find life. And that brings us to the, the third point in the outline here. The third resolve, the price you must evaluate. To, to assess a price, to put a value. Your life, all these hard things, the things you have to give up in comparison to the Lord Jesus Christ. To again this year, to say, Jesus, you are worth it. You are worthy of worship. You may give up your, your dreams, your ambitions, you may give up control of your future. But here the, the price is life. To say, Jesus, you are worth it. You are worth losing all of these things that I could go after for your sake. This is a call to joy. This is not a call to drudgery. If you're living a, a sad, morose Christian life, you are doing it wrong. Jesus calls us to a life of joy in his service. Verse 25, he says, you will find it like the, the parable of the man who found the treasure in the field and he sold everything he had for that treasure. But he says in verse 25, the one who tries to save his life, the one who tries to preserve, to maintain, to, to keep a hold on, to control, working so hard so that nothing will change, that one, he says, the one who is concerned only about self, how do I not give up these things that I love? He says, that one will lose their life. That is a path toward destruction. And he says here, for my sake, the one who loses his life for my sake, the one who is assessed rightly, Jesus is Lord. Not for self-interest, not just as a, an escape from hell, I'm worried about consequences, but because you actually see Jesus as precious. He is your treasure. The, the one who comes to Jesus as Savior and as Lord has a new value system. They have new affections. They, they can finally assess the rest of the world rightly. They see the, the value of their own life compared to the, the value, the insurpassable value of Christ. And they can finally stop living for themselves. As I've thought about this passage, I was just reminded of a, of a story that I heard from a uh, from an, an old neighbor, a story he, he told about his own life. I heard him tell this story several times. And this neighbor would tell a story, and it's probably a familiar story, something you've heard similarly. He talked about growing up in a, in a tough home, growing up with divorced parents in high school, going uh, in with the wrong crowd, starting to party, to drink, making bad decisions, and he, and he knew it was wrong. He didn't feel good about it. And then as he tells the story, he said a friend invites him to, to church, is what he said into this community of people. And they took an interest in him. They were kind to him. He finally saw families that seemed to be functioning well. This man met his wife in this group of people. And now 30 years later, he looks back and he's living a, a really good life. He has a, a nice family. He has a good job. He has a community. He has a good marriage. And he's so glad. He looks back so glad this decision he made when he was a teen. And that's a story that we could resonate with. You know, a community of people, some kind of acceptance. But, but that is not a conversion story to Christianity. That, that neighbor is a, a Mormon who is believing in a false gospel, who is holding on to a man-made religion, seeking to justify himself, to say, I can have heaven and I can still live for myself. That's not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is coming face to face with the person of Jesus Christ. It is coming face to face with the God-man to, to see Jesus in all his glory 
and to see yourself being confronted in the face of Jesus that, that I am actually a sinner, that I, that I am hopeless, I am helpless. You know, to see Jesus and in your conscience to know I cannot be with him in heaven because of my sin. But at the same time to see Jesus and say, I have to let go of all of this. I have to follow that one. That is, that is where faith starts. Coming face to face with the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, assessing him rightly. Giving up everything for his sake. And you come into contact with the Lord Jesus Christ and your life changes. Your priorities change. What you love changes. And here in verse 26, Jesus gives a, a picture of, of scales, of weights. You know, in Bible times where they would weigh commodities on a scale, right? You have two sides to the scale. And here, Jesus, verse 26, talks about two sides here. You have your, your whole life. What would it gain if you, if you profited the, the whole world on one side and forfeited your soul? On this side, the whole world, all the riches, the comforts, the jobs, the career, the houses, the cars, whatever it might be that this world has to offer. And on the other side of the scale is your soul. You put them on the scale. He says, this is no trade, your eternal soul for all the things of this world. This does not make sense. The math does not work. You know, 30 years, 40 years, of these things that will not last, that will not give you joy, that will not give you hope, that will fail you. And we see in this world around us, people make this trade every single day. Every single day we see people make this trade, trade their soul for the things of the world. And I even think about in this room, there might be students in this room. There might be young people in this room that are saying, man, I can't wait to get out of my parents' house. I can't wait to live on my own. I can't wait until I can go out and I can can be free from these rules, I can be free from consequences and I can finally live for all of these things, these friends and this approval, all these things that I want. And if that is you and you are going after the things of this world on the authority of Jesus himself, we can tell you those things are not worth it. Those things will fail you in the end. That is a path toward destruction. And even for the the kids in this room, you know, so many kids that grow up in the church that, that say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait a little longer. I'm going to wait to embrace Jesus. Yeah, yeah, I know that he is king. I know the Bible's true. I'll just wait until I'm older. I'll wait to, to follow him. And Jesus here says, your soul is at stake. To not wait. To not, to not hold your, your soul in the balance here. To not go after things that will fail you. And just consider on the opposite, what does it look like as God's people? What does it look like if we have assessed this rightly? If our lives are actually in line with this command? If people look in at our lives and they say, yes, they value something other than this life. You know, think about your time. Think about your spending. What you think about, what you prioritize, what you look forward to. Do those things reflect this verse? that the things of this world are in no comparison to your soul, are in no comparison to the the joy of following the Lord Jesus Christ. At the the end of a year here, to assess, what are my priorities? What am I going after? What what am I planning to spend my time and resources on? Jim Elliott, a famous quote, I'm sure you've heard it. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Uh, Reflecting on this verse, a man who counted the cost. If you know the story of Jim Elliot, he was speared to death, him and three other men, as missionaries. He left a a wife behind, a a daughter, parents, family members. And you read his biography, and he counted the cost. He said, Jesus is worth it to suffer and die for. And there are people in this room that have counted the cost, that have suffered, that have done hard things, that are doing hard things for the sake of Christ. And here we have on the authority of Jesus himself. You know, I can't tell you that it's going gonna, it's gonna to get easier. I can't tell you that your life will, will get better, that your circumstances will change. But I can tell you on the authority of Jesus that it is worth it. This is what Jesus says, it is worth it. 
to sacrifice for him. You might exchange your, your future plans, maybe your retirement plans, maybe a, a dream of a, of a life with kids and grandkids. You may trade some really good things, but you trade those things for, for Jesus. Jesus here asking us to, to ask ourselves again, is he worth it? Is he worth more than even those good things that we love in this life? Is he worth sacrificing for? We who have been rescued, all of us who are on this path, all of us who believe in Christ were once on this path, going after destruction, willing to, to trade our soul for the things of this world. And we have been rescued. This passage should shake us awake again to take our eyes off the world and point them back on Christ. My wife was reading a, a book earlier this year. It's called the, the Three Wives of Adoniram Judson. And I think someone was like, man, that's a weird title. He's not, not a polygamist. He, uh, he had three wives because, because his wives kept dying on the mission field. If you, if you know who Ad- Adoniram Judson is, he, uh, he was a pioneer missionary, one of the first American missionaries in Burma, India. And his, his first wife, he writes this letter to his father-in-law asking for her hand in marriage. And I'm just going to read you an excerpt of this letter. It's just a, a wonderful assessment. You get to see a man who is weighing the cost, who is saying, here is all of the the hardship, the cost of following Christ. But here is, here is what you gain. This is what he writes to his father-in-law. He says, I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring, to see her no more in this world, whether you can consent to her departure and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of a missionary life, whether you can consent to her exposure, to the dangers of the ocean, to the fatal influence of the southern climate of India, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. This is the cost, written to her father. But then he says, Can you consent to all of this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and who died for her and for you, for the sake of the perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God? Can you consent to all of this in hope of soon meeting your daughter in the world of glory, with the crown of righteousness, brightened with the acclamations of praise which shall redound to her Savior from heathen saved through her means from eternal woe and despair. Here, here is him weighing the cost, this great cost, but here is the, the reward. This is where Jesus concludes, yes, you will give up. Yes, you will lose. Yes, you will sacrifice. But it will be worth it. We have to, in our hearts, wrestle to the ground the, the love of self, like Peter, that would, would have an aversion to, to hard things for the sake of Christ and believe this passage to know that this life is not all there is. And, and that's where Jesus ends in verse 27 and 28. But back to, to verse 21. Even in, in Jesus unfolds his plan. He says, Jesus, he must be killed, but he must be raised on the third day. That's where this is going. Yes, there is suffering. Yes, there is death. But there is glory that is coming. First, suffer and die, but then resurrection, exaltation, glorification of Christ, victory over death. And Jesus knows that we're going to waver. He knows that we're going to be weak. And here in verse 27, he, he points us forward. Yes, he will be king. Verse 27, the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels. He will return in glory, all of heaven with him, glorified. And that brings us to the, the last point here. As you think about just resolutions, resolves for the new year. To finally, to, to cling to this promise. There is a promise here you must cling to. You must fix your hope on this promise of Jesus coming to rule and to reign. Jesus is not saying, no, I'm not, I'm not coming to rule. You missed it, Peter. He's saying, Peter, you, you, you have the wrong motivation here. You miss the, the suffering that is necessary. Here, the, the Son of Man, he will reign. The Son of Man is this title that Jesus loves to use for himself. It harkens back to the book of Daniel. 
this, this title of a, of a messianic ruler, one from the line of Adam, a, a man who also walks in the throne room of God, who will rule on the earth, who will reverse the curse, who will carry out God's justice on this earth. This one, this is guaranteed. This is what Peter confessed. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. There is certain victory. He will reign. In verse 27, this sobering statement, he will return. And when he returns, he will repay every man according to his deeds. You could say it a different way. You could say what you do in this life, it matters for eternity. It matters. You know, as you consider your plans and your priorities, as you consider a new year, to consider it all under the banner of this verse, Jesus will repay according to your deeds. What you do in this life matters. If it didn't matter, Christian, you wouldn't be here. God would have saved you and then brought you directly to heaven. And God has a, a purpose for your life. He is bringing glory to himself through your life. What you do in this life, it matters. And this passage is all about us aligning our will, our desires with God's purposes. God's purposes to exalt his son, Jesus who will be glorified. And to be so convinced of that truth that you're willing to do hard things in this life. And for the Christian, we know that our sin has been paid for. There's no condemnation. You know, not to look forward to this day and say there's condemnation, but to, but to imagine yourself in the presence of Jesus. To stand before him empty-handed when he comes. To say in front of Christ, I lived so much of my life for myself. You gave me one life. You gave me so many opportunities. You put me in a church. You gave me gifts. You gave me abilities. You gave me resources. And so, many, so much of those I spent for myself. Imagine the, the tragedy to stand before Christ and to say, I've wasted so much of the opportunities you gave me. And scarier, sadder, more tragic than that is the one who stands before Christ, as Matthew 7 says, where Jesus would, would say, depart from me, I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. You know, your deeds they exposed what you love most. You may have said the right things. You may have been to church every Sunday. But Jesus knows the heart. And he is saying, your deeds will expose what you love on that day. In the future, Christ will reveal those who have embraced him as Lord. In the scripture, it always brings us to this fork in the road. For us, as believers in Christ, to see the, these two categories of people, those who have embraced Christ and those who have not. And for us again to say, for us again to say, Jesus, I follow you. I believe you are king. To, to re-up at the end of a year and say, yes, to Jesus. I want to I commit this year to you. I want to live a life of conviction. And in verse 28, as this section closes, there's a, a physical picture, uh, just a kindness of the Lord, a promise. Yes, he will be king, verse 27. And then in verse 28, let me show you. And you could take this verse a couple different ways. He says in verse 28, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And some people may take that verse to, to say, maybe the, the resurrection he's talking about, there's a, a spiritual reality initiated uh, at Christ's resurrection, the, the disciples are going to partake, they're going to see. I, I think it's better to, to take it, to keep reading, and to take this as a specific encouragement to some of the disciples. To look at the, the next section, chapter 17, verse 1, six days later, connecting these two sections together, still fresh in your mind, Jesus, Jesus' words in verse 28. Six days later, Jesus took some of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. Verse 27 here, we saw Jesus saying, the Son of Man will return. Verse 28, See, I'm going I'm to give you a preview. I want to fortify you. I want to fortify your faith, Peter, James, and John. You're going to suffer much for my name. Peter, who waffles here? Peter, who's, who's so quick to cry out, what about me? Jesus, in his kindness, gives him a picture 
of, of him in glory. Peter, it is worth it. I am going to return as king. So that his disciples would be convinced. Convinced that the, the suffering is worth it. Convinced that, yes, a crown of righteousness awaits you. That you'd be more confident in the future than what you, you see and you feel now. That what's so hard in this life. And as you, as you read the book of Acts, you think about the book of Acts. Who, who stands out immediately as the most bold proclaimer of truth? It's Peter. Right? Peter, who was not wanting to suffer, had an aversion to this path. He stands up and preaches at great cost to himself. Listen to what he says in Acts 2.23. Acts 2.23, This man, Jesus was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, and you nailed him to a cross and put him to death. Peter here, saying the words of Jesus from verse 21 of chapter 16, that the Son of Man must suffer. Peter now agrees with that. This was God's plan all along. This truth has resonated in Peter. He has been gripped so much by this truth, he's willing to to preach it. He's willing to suffer for it. As you fast forward to to chapter 5, the disciples are beat. Peter is beat. And what do they do? They rejoice that they are counted worthy to suffer for his name. They have conviction. These truths have taken root. So how, how do you get this kind of resolve, this kind of conviction? Well, it starts here with aligning your will, your thoughts, under submission to God's will. What he has revealed in Scripture you know, to fight this monster of self, you know, to, to weigh what, what the priorities of your life, what are you going after, and weigh those against what this passage commands. To ask yourself, am, am I aligned with God's priorities? Am I aligned with the exaltation of Christ in my life? And this starts Monday morning. As you wake up Monday morning, and you start to make a plan for your week and an agenda for your week, and you submit those plans, lay them at the feet of Jesus, say, I submit these under your will. You wake up and you say, Jesus, this day is yours. You are the master. I want to live a life of sacrifice today for you. I want to deny myself today for you. I want to obey you. I want to be a a worshiper as I parent, as I work. And that is what this world needs, is those who hold high the name of Christ by the way that they live. Lives that demonstrate, yes, Jesus is indeed worthy. He's indeed worthy of sacrifice. He's worthy of obedience. This world needs to see marriages that demonstrate that. Uh, Husbands and wives that are willing to sacrifice, deny themselves, to say, yes, Jesus is worthy. And it shows in the way that they love each other. That's what this church needs That's what the the unreached people of this world need. They need those who are are committed to following Christ at at great cost, at sacrifice. And back to where I started, just to imagine another generation of the church that, that is gripped by these same truths. That say, yes, Lord Jesus, I want to align my life after your purposes. I'm not going to, to live for my own agenda my own ambitions, my own comforts, even my own dreams of the future. I want to submit all of those things under you, Jesus. I want to live all out in your service. Whatever it costs, whatever it takes, because you are worthy of worship, Jesus. You are worthy of all those things. So as we, as we close, let me pray that the Lord would indeed raise up more men and women a church even, a whole church of that kind of conviction. Father, we know that you love to glorify your Son, that you will exalt your Son, and that that our lives get to be a, a demonstration. The way that we live this week gets to demonstrate our, our love for Christ. In, in how we love one another, and how we speak, and how we work, and how we parent. 
So I pray that we would do those things under the banner as blood-bought children. And Lord, I, I pray even this morning as I think about just the, the young people in this room, another generation, I pray that you would raise up those who are gripped by these truths. Even if it's just one person this morning that is gripped, so gripped by this truth that their life trajectory would change, that their ambitions for the future would change, that you would raise up missionaries and church planters, those who are willing to say, Jesus, you are worth suffering for, that you are precious. That, that is what this world needs, Lord. So I pray that you would do that even in this church. We love you, Jesus. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.